I'm going to study just a little bit about um, something I've studied about a lot in the last year. And last, I took several several services, especially on, on Wednesday evening. I want you to turn in James chapter two. James chapter two, and we're going to read verses one through seventeen. Sorry, guys, I didn't give you that scriptures back there, but. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 17, and then we've got a few other verses as well, but we're going to start with this one. James chapter 2, 1 through 17. If you don't mind, uh, just read along with me. I hope you pray that you have your Bibles and that you're ready to go. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and do it goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, which means good clothing or the fine clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich, do rich, excuse me, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that war that um, Worthy name by the which ye are called. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit a sin. Let me just read that part one more time. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit a sin. And are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now, I'm not going to spend any time at all, but I do want just to touch, because of the world and the times and the situations we're living in, I emphasize the, a verse there, because I want you to know the verse. It's not my words. It's not somebody else's words. It's God's words and, and His Bible that we're not supposed to be, as God is not, a respecter of persons. Now, I want you to understand that word for just a moment, and I'm not even going to deal with it. I have no intentions of dealing with it, but I want to, since it's there, and we read it, I want to deal with it just for a second, okay? It says not to, and it goes in great detail, how that we're not supposed to respect persons. If we do, it's sin. Now, I want you to understand what it's not talking about here. It's not just talking about building one person up or tearing another person down. It's talking about putting anybody in preeminence over anybody else. I don't care if you're sitting here and you've got a million dollars. And some of you may do it, and I don't know about it. Brother Ed probably got two million. I don't know. But I'm telling you, whatever it is, his possessions does not make him rich. You can be the richest person in the world, and if you're sitting there dying and going to hell, you're poorer than anybody else that's on this earth. Your riches, your possessions, your money, your fame, your fortune, your power is not what, you, what, what it is that it makes you important. What makes us important is the fact that we love the Lord. And the Bible tells us to love all men equally. 
In other words, he says, love all men. In fact, he goes on to say, well, what about your enemies? He says, love them too. Now, this is a hard thing for us, the humans, to get in our mind. I can tell you it's hard because we're guilty. I know we don't like to think about us ever being guilty of anything, but we are guilty in the church, not just just church, but the churches of the world. We're guilty of giving somebody that comes in that looks good, that acts good, that looks like they got a nice suit on or nice clothes on and got a little bit of a jingle in their pocket. We're going to say, hey, come on up. Here, here, here's a nice seat. And if somebody comes in with a with a dirty clothes and ragged hair and they come in and they, they're just kind of barely coming in, sneak, almost sneaking in, you better keep an eye on them because they might be up to trouble. I can just sense trouble, and I think that's trouble. I thought that about Clarence when I first met him. I said, there's, there's trouble. I'm kidding, Clarence. But we do that. You say, well, not me. Don't lie. It don't help your case if you're going to throw a lie over, over a respecting person. But I want you to understand how serious God thinks about this. It's not just something that's not good. It's something that's sinful. He said, whoever does that is sinful or acting upon sin. In other words, you're willfully going against God's word. Now, I want you to understand this. I do not expect nor desire and no, do not want in this church or anywhere else for the white man to be lifted up because they're white. That's just due to pigment of your skin. If you get down past the skin, we're all the same color. There was a guy that went to church with us. He's no longer around. But he come and we went to his hospital bed one day and visit with his wife, and, and he sat there and he says he wanted to give, make sure to give his wife good blood. She said, sir, when I get the blood, it's all red. I don't know if it's black, white, red, pink with purple polka dots. I don't know if it's yellow skins or, or, or brown skin. I don't know what kind of person it come from. I just know it's been tested and it's good blood and it's safe for your, your wife. Can I tell you something? We are made by flesh and blood in the same maker that made you and I made them and they. We need to be careful in the world we live in not to put anybody, I don't care who they are, what title they have, what possessions they own, what they look like, what they smell like, how they act. I don't care. It does not matter. We're all souls. That's the way we got to look at people. And if we'll look at everyone as a soul that needs to go to heaven, our mindset will be a lot different in our churches today. If you all would have picked 12 disciples in the world when Jesus was walking the earth, I guarantee you those 12 he picked, would have never been on your A, B, or C list. They'd have been down here. Oh, my goodness, that's the last ones that I had to pick. Oh, great. We're never going to win. I remember in, in school when we used to play softball or something or other. There was these kids, bless their heart, they were always the last ones to get picked. I felt so bad for them when I finally become, you know, everybody rotates and becomes captain. I picked them first just to kind of throw the whole thing out. We lost. But they felt great. Big deal, we lost a game. I hate to lose. But they're more important than me losing or winning. We've got to think that way in reality in our world today. The scripture says us respecting persons is sin. The next time we start preeminent, the next time we start lifting somebody up, next time we start put, putting somebody on a pedestal, we need to remember what we're doing. You see, what happens is if you start lifting somebody up, you're going to put somebody down. And if you put somebody down, you're going to lift somebody else up. It's never an ending process, and the devil loves it. Because when you lift somebody up, you know what happens? They get pride. Oh, wow, I must be something else. I'm special. Wow, they just bragged on me. They, think my, they thought my sermon was good three weeks ago. You know what I mean? I, 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 everybody loves a pat on the back. And everybody loves encouragement. I'm not saying that. But we've got to be careful what we're doing. Now let's get on to what we're going to talk about. 
The Bible says in the last verses of this, in verse 16, And one, you, one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be you warmed and not filled, or in filled, notwithstanding you give them not the, those things which are needful to the body, with what does it profit? And then he says these wonderful, amazing words that it should make every one of us in this building think about what we're doing. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Everybody knows about Ab Ab I don't even know his name, so I don't know if y'all know him or not. Everybody knows about Alexander Graham Bale. He was a great inventor. I don't know if you know, but he invented many things other than the telephone. I, I just looked it up, and I mean, he was an inventor of so many things. The tricycle was invented by the hearing aids, or the testing your hearing was invented by Alexander Graham Bell. The telegraph, the autometer, he, he, he found landing gear for the planes. I mean, he'd done a lot of great things. And then he invented, of course, this wonderful thing called, I don't know if it's wonderful some days or if it's terrible. I'm not sure. I'm kind of up in the air on that one. But he invented this great invention called the telephone. It revolutionized the whole world. But here's what happened. I don't know if you know the history of it, but when Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, he kept putting off getting it patented. You know, when you get a patent, it means I done it. It basically testifies to the whole world that I'm the first. So he sits there, and he gets this wonderful thing called a telephone. He keeps putting it off. He's about 20-something years old, so I can imagine his priorities are a little bit different than some 50 or 60. Finally, his father-in-law, after so many times of getting on to him and talking to him, finally says, Alexander, I'm going to do it for you. And he goes to the government. And he patents the telephone in behalf of Alexander Graham Bell. Do you realize within hours, another young man, Mr. Gray, I can't remember his first name, I wrote it down, it's maybe John, I don't remember his name. But he come in and guess what he had invented? The telephone. Within hours, history could have changed if his daddy-in-law had not went and patented the Alexander Graham Bell's great invention of the telephone, we would not have been celebrating him like we are today. You see, he had a, a heart for it. He had the invention. But the dad done something about it. Just believing is not enough. The devil believes the Bible says, and he quivers, he shakes. He's scared to death because he knows the power of God more than anybody because he's been defeated so many times. But let me tell you something. We can sit and say, I have faith, but faith without works is useless. The Bible says it's dead. You say, well, useless. You said useless. Okay. Well, tell me a dead man that's very useful. When you want to do something and build a barn, or, or I, we were working on the bathrooms in the men's bathroom today, or, and yesterday and the day before, when we're doing that, I'm not going to call up, hey, uh, Grandpa, who's been dead for a while now, that would be idiotic, wouldn't it? It'd be crazy. To call up a dead man is useless. Can I tell you something? We are useless in the church if we're not putting our faith into action. Faith without works is dead. If we're not using what God has given us, it's as good as if He had never gave it to us. You understand that? I hope you get this because it's really necessary in our church. We are great about a lot of things, but this is something I want us to beef up on. I want us to really challenge ourselves. How do I know that? Because Witnessing is part of taking that step of faith. But I'm scared. I don't care. I, I love to say that in my house. Uh, my son says, well, Dad, it's hard. I said, I don't care. But there's a lot of questions on that homework. I don't care. Uh, but I don't want to do it. It doesn't matter. I don't care. You're going to do it anyway. I think sometimes God wants to tell us, I don't care. Get busy.
I've empowered you. I've given you faith. I've given you grace. I've given you mercy. I've given you salvation. I've given you everything you need. And you sit there and act like you can't. You can too. You don't even know because you never tried. Amen. We sit in church and we go through message after message, sermon after sermon, service after service, and we sit here and we take it all in and we absorb it. And then we go home and sit in the rockers. Or we go to work and we just go to work. We're never supposed to be like everybody else. Do you realize that sermons, messages, book of Bi the Bible, God's Word, the anointing, is useless unless we put it into practice? Anybody? So my question, I guess, to me and you and everybody else that's ever listened to this scripture or this word, how much are you using it? You see, faith is a wonderful gift from God. And that's what the Bible tells us it is. It's a gift from God. But faith not being used is almost a condemnation to us. Meaning that we've got something and we've been empowered, but we're not even doing anything with it. Now, you know the scriptures, how that God gave some gifts and some talents to one. And he gave uh, five talents to one, three talents to another, one talent to another. He gave two or three times he used that in scripture. And then he says, but to the one, he gives one talent he didn't do anything with. He buried, he kept it. He never done nothing with it. And so God took that talent and gave it to somebody else. My wife brought a wonderful sermon on that here just a few weeks ago. I wonder to myself, now I can't answer it for you and I'm not even going to try. I got a hard enough time answering for me. But I wonder to us tonight as a church body, what are we really accomplishing? If we were to say, our church does this to reach the world. What? I don't want you answering because I don't want to embarrass us. But what are we doing? Our church is doing this to get outside of our walls and to get to our community right here in our area. Then I want to ask you, what are we doing? All right, forget to just, just not, let's not deal with the church for a minute. Let's just set that to the side and we'll come back to that in a minute. What if I say, okay, I can't resp uh, respond for you and I can't answer for you. I just got to answer for me. And that's probably what you're telling me. Well, I can't talk to the whole church. I'm not the pastor. That's a good excuse, I guess. But let me ask you this. Let's set the church aside. Let's just say, what are you doing? What are you doing as an individual to use God's faith, grace, mercy, salvation, redemption, justification, propitiation, sacrificial gift that God has given, all that we have, we've been talking about it for weeks. What are we doing? What are we doing with it? How are we reaching any lost? How are we bringing them in? How are we witnessing? Are we talking to them? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to wake us up and say, hey, we got work to do. We got work to do. Yeah, but it's hard times. I know that, and God knew it long before we did. It's no excuse. <laughs> I can see God said, I don't care. I can handle the hard times. I, you think this is hard? You ought to see the Israelites when they're in Egyptian uh, bondage. You think this is hard? You ought to see the three Hebrews right, right before they go into the fiery furnace. You think this is hard? So talk to Daniel while he's in the lion's den. You think this is hard? Talk to David right before he's looking at a nine-foot giant. Hello? God's handled hard before and he can handle it again. It's not God's say, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do this time. Oh, come on. He's God. <laughs> you, can't, you can't pull that on God. He knows the end before the beginning and he knew what was going to happen and what we've been going through now. We can't blame our situation and our world situation. Well, this is so hard. No, no, no. It's not an excuse. I'm sorry, it's not. Faith is still without works is dead. In other words, we are dead people walking. <laughs> My daughter, I don't know if it's still popular. She actually got me kind of hooked on it a little bit. I know you're going to condemn me after I tell you what it is, but you, you, it's all right. I've been condemned by other people before. It's not a big deal. 
I'll get over it. You will too. But anyway, my daughter several years ago started watching this craziest movie you ever seen. Craziest one you ever heard of, I think. And I, 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 and I, was, I, I watched it. The Walking Dead. Yeah, you know, The Walking Dead. People that's got contaminated, I think is the way it was, they got contaminated with this virus and it, it took the brain and they're just walking dead. They're dead people, but they're walking. No, that kind of contrary to one another in the first place. But anyway, you get the picture. It's zombies. They're zombies. That's a big thing anymore. I don't know why it's such a popular thing anymore. I guess because we got a lot of them walking around right now here around the world. It seems like they're zombies. They ain't got no brains. They ain't got no logic. They ain't got no common sense. So they're just zombies. But let me ask you this. These walking dead are sitting there and they're, 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 they're just running for these walking dead. I'm thinking, hold it. They're brainless people. How hard would it be? To keep brainless people away from you. Come on. Sometimes I think we're kind of the walking dead. Well, thanks, Brother Don. You called us brainless. No, I'm calling us, I'm calling us there was great potential, and we're not using the potential that God's put in us. Do you realize the Bible tells us that all things are possible to us? The Christians that believe in Jesus Christ that's been resurrected by the blood of the Lamb, that's been empowered by God's Spirit. We have all things possible to available to us, and what are we doing with it? Do you even believe that the Bible tells us that we are able to do greater things than even Jesus did? When I think of that verse, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I'm coming way short of what God wanted me to do. And then we start using the word age. We use that word age a lot. You know, oh my goodness, but I'm older. I'm, you know, I'm 51 now. Don't have the energy. Don't have the backbone. I just, I'm just tired a lot more than I used to be. My foot aches. I mean, the horse stepped on my foot. It's hurting. I mean, I, my back hurts. My, my neck, you know, I had a motorcycle wreck, so I had a neck break. Listen. Who are we thinking we're fooling when we think, that we're, well, my age? Be thankful that God's given you the age you got and use every day you can because we're one day step, one step closer to the grave every moment we live. So instead of being complaining about, oh, my age, say, praise God, look at my age, and I'm still going. What I'm saying is we, we're, we're the king and queens of excuses. But the only real problem with all the excuses in the world is this. They really don't matter. And they're really not helping you and they're definitely not helping them. Then we use the words, but what if they don't like what I tell them? How many of you, just raise the hands, how many of you are parents or grandparents? Not just now, but any time, right? Parents or grandparents. Most of us, right? Have you ever had to tell your kids something they didn't like? I mean, hello, your parents, are, that's a, the very definition of being a parent or grandparent is telling your kids, I, you're going to do this whether you like it or not. Right? We've all been there. We've all said it. And we did it. Why did we do that? Because we didn't like those kids? Because we hated those kids? Because we were mad at them? Because we go going to show whom the boss. No, you know why we did that? Because we loved them. And we cared about them. And we knew what's best for them. And we were trying to help them. And we were trying to teach them. Can I tell you something? That's exactly what we got to do for the people that live around us. But what if they're mean to us? Your kids can't be, listen, they can't be any meaner than your kids do sometimes. But they'll hurt my feelings. Get over it. Get over it. There's worse things than your feeling to go. Think about this. Think about if you don't say anything and they go to hell. Brother Don, you're getting awful hard on us tonight. No, I'm just being very blunt and honest. Faith without works is a lot of churches today. And yeah, I got news for you. It's going to be our church unless we do something about it. But it's not too late. 
Because we're not dead yet. But we're heading to the grave. When I first came here, I thought, man, this church is on fire. We were having some services that were just, I thought, out of sight. Man, the altars were getting filled. People were getting saved. We were getting excited. I was getting excited. The jury was getting excited. I mean, we were happy. We were rejoicing. We were throwing hands up. We were crying. We were praising God for just how good God is. And then this stupid, crazy, idiotic, microscopic thing called a virus come along. And we said, well, we can't. We ain't no smooth no more. Well, we got a mask on. Quit using excuses and say, God, you've given us another day. You've blessed us another time. You've done more for us than we ever deserved. I'm going to praise you. See, we're not only hindered with our faith out there. Sometimes we're hindered right here. Our faith ought to have works in the church. Hello, anybody home? Faith without works is dead. If I'm not careful, I promise you, I, I've been tempted to do this sometimes. I promise you I have. I, I, I'll never do it. Well, I will never say never. I may do it one day. I've been tempted to actually say, like, Bart, come here. I want you to stand up here with me. I want you to watch the faces of the people as we're having service. <laughs> See what you think. Hello? Love you. But you know what I'm talking about. Because sometimes when I'm up here and I'm preaching and I, I, I'm going to, and God's, man, I feel God in my heart. I mean, I'm preaching as hard and good, good as straight as I can. And I mean, God's blessing up here and I'm getting excited and I'm looking at you and I'm thinking, holy moly, what's going on out there? What happened? Did somebody do something I missed that made everybody mad? Hello? You see, faith without works, we can blame it on out there, but we, if we can't work it in here, then how's it going to work out? Hello? See, faith without works is dead, but the only way you're going to have faith with works is because you get a fresh anointing from the Spirit of God and His life just beams out in you and you can't contain it anymore. Amen. And He gets you so happy, you say, oh, i got to tell somebody. Do you remember when you first got saved and God come down and just relieved all the burdens of your soul and you felt like you could fly and you said, i got to tell the world how good this is. And so, man, I was ready to save the world that day. Oh, we need a fresh anointing. We need a fresh anointing. We need a fresh outpouring of God's Holy Spirit that might move in our souls, that might refresh our hearts, that might give us genuine, heartfelt, God-fearing, your spirit where we can get excited about the things of God. I love you. I, I mean it. I wouldn't be here if I didn't. I would not say I'm going to continue to pastor this church unless I genuinely had a godly love for you all. But here's the thing. When we have revival, try this. Receive revival. Not because some other man standing up here or somebody else is singing, but because you want the things of God in your heart more than anything else in this world. Rejoice in the things of God. Faith. Faith is a strange thing that sometimes we're really, it's like a mysterious potion. I'll be honest with you, it's not so mysterious. Faith is the same thing, substance of things hoped for. And it's evidence of things that's not seen. I, I want you to notice the first word. It says, faith is, is, faith is, faith exists, faith is. In other words, it's not something it used to be, it is right now. It's present right here. 
And God says in His Word, He says, God has given every man a measure of... Is it not still there? Still there, Andy Jean. I haven't ran it in the last day or two, but it's still there. Faith is... Faith is... And I start thinking about it, and I wonder if I have faith. You ever wonder that? Lord, how much faith do I have? Here's how I know you've got faith. You know, maybe you can start looking at your own self like this, but if you've got faith, you're going to start walking on faith. And faith does not come with the Word, and the faith is coming with the Word, but the Word that God's saying faith is coming with the hearing of the Word of God means that it's not just coming with the Logos. Logos in the Greek means just the Word of God, meaning it's just reading the Word. But faith comes in the ramos. Ramos is where you're hearing the Word. In other words, what I'm saying is when Peter was in the boat, remember the Peter in the boat? I love that little scripture. I'm going to use it a bunch of times because it's so powerful. But he Peter's in the boat with all his other disciples, and Jesus is walking here. And he says, that's Jesus. And Jesus, he says, hey, tell me to come to you. And Jesus says, come. That was a word from the Lord. Peter would have never took the first step off that boat. Until he heard the word of the Lord. And once he heard the word, he was able to do all things. You know what the problem with the churches of today is? We're reading a lot. We're talking a lot. We're, we're watching a lot. But we're not hearing much from the Lord. Amen. We're, we're, we're reading the word every now and then. We're praying even. But we're not getting a word from the Lord. Because if you can hear a word from the Lord, I'm telling you, it changes everything. You go from land dwellers to sea walkers. Hello. You go from somebody that's running from God to somebody that's running to God. You go from somebody that's kind of dead and cold to somebody that can't hardly stand to brimming over. That's what happens when the word of the Lord sets foot in your life. I got a news for you. I wonder. I wonder in my own heart. I wonder for you. I wonder for the world right now. When's the last time we've heard a word from the Lord? A genuine word, not just to the church, not a great message, not a sermon, not something you heard on television. I mean, I'm talking about from God himself. He really spoke to you. Well, God don't do that. Yes, he does. Oh, honey, he does. And when he does, you're able to conquer 10,000 demons because faith just stepped in. You see, that's where faith is really abundant is when you get the word from the Lord and then faith is easy to walk on then. Peter could never well, took the first step on the water until he got the word from the Lord. And then all of a sudden he says, huh, he said it, I can do it because I know he will never say something I couldn't handle. Too many of us have got churchitis. We enjoy coming to church. We enjoy the social fair. We enjoy the little sermons the little fella puts up. We enjoy coming together. We enjoy the little singing we got going on. We enjoy a lot of things about church, but the one I really want you to fall in love with is not just church, but God. Church can only carry you as far as God's got you. That's pretty good, Lisa. You got that one now? Church can only carry you as far as God's got you. And I wonder how much God has got us. So how do I know, Brother Don? I'm going to close with this. How do I know, Brother Don, if God's got me? How do I know if I'm where I need to be? How do I know if I've got faith? How do I know if I'm not just sitting on our faith and not been doing anything with it? Here's how you know. The very thing that Jesus told the whole disciple, he said, what's the greatest two commandments? Love the Lord thy God. Do you love God? Do you love God with every ounce of your being? Why, Brother Donald, I can't believe you're asking me that. I've been going to church for a long time here. I can't believe you're asking me that kind of question. I can't either, but just get over it and listen to me just for a minute. Because if you love God, you're going to show God that you love Him. 
faith without, I'm still on the same verse, faith without works is dead. If we love God, we're going to show God that we love him. And if you're not showing God that you love him, how do I do that, Brother Donald? That's a good question. You should have figured it out a long time ago. And I'm sure some of you have, but let me just tell you, just in case. Here's how you do that. You get in the word and you find out what his commandments say. You find out what his word says and you do it to everything you knew. You make that word a priority in your life. You make your prayer life a priority in your life. You make this church a priority in your life. And you make the things of God a priority in your life. That's how you know. In our day and time, our children, our young people are growing up and we just can take church and we can leave it. It's no big deal. I was talking to them earlier on, Sister, Sister Will and Brother Jean. I said, I want you to look over our congregation. Most of our heads are white because we grew up in a different era than we have now. In the era that I grew up, man, you got to church, you got to church 30 minutes early, at least 15 minutes earlier. You were late. And you know why you did it? Because you were scared to death you are going to miss something good that's about to happen. Amen? And now we almost have to drag them in. You want a little food? Come on in. We'll give you some food if you come in in. I'm not against giving food, but goodness gracious. If they knew the manna that we were eating of, they would be flocking to our courts. But how do they know if we never tell them? You see, if you love God, you're going to be telling the whole world how good he is. I don't want you to answer, and I'm going to go on my next one, and I'm going to hush. I know what you're thinking right now, Lord, Brother Donald, I love the Lord. Then let me ask you a simple question. How many people you've told? In the last week, how many people have you witnessed to? How many people have you just told how good God is? How many people have you told how good the Lord's blessed you? How many people have you told how much you love them? How many people have you witnessed to? How many people have you asked, say, hey, why don't you come to me? How many have we reached out to? If we really love God, and when we're going to brag on him a little bit. I love my grandkids more than anything in the world. They're the most precious things I've ever seen. I'd have skipped my kids and went straight to the grandkids if I could have. I love them little boogers. Oh, they're ornery. They're getting hurt. They make a mess. But they're grandpa boys. And that little Eli, he, he's my little daughter. She, he'll get on the phone and say, Peppa, Peppa, Peppa. He can't say anything else, but he said, Peppa. Greatest kid ever lived. I told my daughter the other day, I said, I can't wait till he learns another word because he just says, there, Peppa. I said, Peppa loves you. Peppa. Peppa can say, you're going to see Peppa. Peppa. That's all I kept saying. It's a one-way conversation, but he says, Peppa. That's all that matters. You know what? I'll brag on that kid for to anybody who'll sit and listen. And God's so much better than that. And we keep our mouth shut. Don't tell me we love God if we're not going to tell nobody about it. We don't love God like we think we do. We need to start loving Him deep down in our soul. We need to start getting acquainted with Him again. We need to start feeling Him again. We need to start getting the anointing of Him again. I'm telling you, we need to be God's people. Amen. You ought to be the greatest champion that God has. You ought to be the cheerleaders that God wants. You, might, you ought to make, you ready for this? This was a good one. You ought to make God embarrassed because you brag on him too much. It don't happen very often, but I've had a few people in my lifetime when they sit there and say, boy, he's, he's a good preacher. He's a good preacher. Boy, that little fellow, he can preach. I mean, he's old-fashioned, just a good preacher. And I mean, he's almost embarrassing after a while. I say, okay, we got the picture. Shh. Better. Steve Flannery used to do that to me all the time. Embarrass me the socks off of me. I think, Steve, shh. When you love something, you want to brag on it. We ought to embarrass God for how much we brag on him. Let me tell you another way, and I'm going to shut up here in a minute. You ready? You ought to love God, but you ought to also love the people. How does my faith been working? Here's how it gets. Love the Lord, first of all, and that's why I'm doing time. And then love people. 
And don't be a respecter of who you love. Love everybody. Why should I do that? Because Jesus did. And last time I checked, being a Christian means I'm being Christ-like, which means I'm following in Jesus' footsteps. And so I'm supposed to do what he did. And I'm thankful he was like that because if he wasn't, I would not be saved today because I wouldn't have picked me. I'd have passed by me a million ways over before I'd got me. But God seen something in me that I did not see myself. And thank God tonight I'm saved and sanctified and I'm on my way to heaven. And I'm going to cry, I'm going to press, I'm going to press toward the mark just like it says in the Bible and just like I'm going to try to do. By the grace of God, I'm going to enter the portal gates of heaven. One day I'm going to make it, Brother Clarence. One day, Brother Fred, I'm going to go to that wonderful place called heaven. But on my way... I'm going to drag as many on with me as I can. The Bible tells us to go out in the highways and hedges and compel. Compel. You know what that means? Oh, you want to go to church with me? No. Okay. That ain't compelling. That's being a wimp. You ain't selling vacuum cleaners. You're, you're telling about the Lord. You're not trying to sell raffle tickets to them people. You're trying to tell them how good God is. We give up too easy. We give up way too easy. Brother Elijah, when we go out and compel somebody, that means I don't give up. <laughs> I don't give up. Sister Mary, if, if, if people if people done me like some of us do their, them, I would never, never be saved today. If they were to give up on me like some people give up on them right now, I would have never been standing before you today. But praise God, there was a few. There wasn't many, but there was a few. They loved me so much. They cared. I don't understand why. I don't understand. They must have had a word from the Lord. Because they didn't quit on me. Wouldn't you like somebody in your life that believed in you so much, no matter what you did, what you said, how you acted, they still believed in you. And they still wanted the best for you. You see, everybody wants that. And that's the way the Bible says we're to make the way attractive, to make the way attractive to come to church. How do I know i got faith? And how do I know it's working? That I'm loving God with all my heart and that I'm reaching other people for the cause of God. Because that's all that matters. Your raise is great, but it doesn't matter in all the grand scheme of things. Because all you're going to do is spend every time you get just like you did before. Hello? Any other spenders in, your mind in the world just like me? Years ago, my wife and I was barely making it. A couple, three, maybe two or three, four hundred dollars a week, and man, we were we were a couple hundred dollars a week, and we were struggling. Really, I mean, we I don't know how she did it, but she made the bills, and we never was late. I got a big graze. I got a new job. I got more money. Went to work at Toyota in Georgetown, Kentucky, making oodles of money compared to what I was. And you know what? We still scraped by and barely made the bills, exactly like we did before we ever made an extra dime. One day it hit me. I said, honey, I'm working and making more money. I'm working all the overtime I can. And before we barely made it, now I'm making all this money. What in the world happened? Would you want to do it? I believe God's sitting there and he's pouring out his blessings more than we could ever imagine. I, in fact, I don't even believe it. I know it. He's blessed you and me more than we ever deserve. And we are sitting there and we're just soaking it in and we're just not using it for God's glory. We're not doing it in great wisdom. We need to do what God wants us to do. Faith without works. I want not to be that my testimony today. I don't want that to be my testimony. And I don't think you do either. I think I want my faith to start working that the kingdom of God might advance. Amen?
Amen. Amen. Then let's see something happen. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Faith is going to do great things in this church once we employ it in our lives. I can't wait. I can't wait and I hope and pray that you can either to see what God's about to do in this place. I want you to just pray with me. We're going to dismiss. But as we pray, I want you to just pray this way. Don't be thinking about nobody else or nothing else. Don't be thinking about your job, your car, your house, no bills, no kids, no nothing. Just blank all that out as best your ability. I know that's hard, but just do it as best you can. And I want you to pray for one thing. God, I want to know, is there anything in my life that's hindering my walk with you? Because if you've got something hindering, then you can't go any farther than that. That's step one, and you've got to make sure that step's taken care of before anything else can work. Faith will never work over sin. You've got to relieve yourself of the sin, and then when the sin's gone, then faith can be in, 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 installed. Lord, help me to make sure there's nothing in my life that's hindered my walk. And then once you figure out that God said, okay, you're free, you're good, you're ready to meet me, then you can start saying, okay, Lord, help my faith to work. And I can see things happen in my life and other people's lives that I encounter. Let's pray. Father, we humbly bow before you and we come before your heavenly throne because we realize that God you're a God that's merciful and kind and gracious and patient but Lord we also come before you because we know we're a needy people we're a people that is in dire need of you and your presence and your spirit tonight God we want to please you we really want to please you and we want to do your will Father, I feel within my soul that I can testify for every person here. We're not a lazy people. We're not quitters. We don't want an easy way out, but God, we truly want to live for you, and we truly want to work for you, and we truly want our faith. We want our faith working for the kingdom of God. And Lord, we love you with all of our heart. We truly love you. And God, help us to show that love in a greater way today. Help us not to have faith without works, but help us to have faith with works so that our trees are running over with fruit, that our church is overrun with people and saints are moving and talking and walking and witnessing for your kingdom's sake. Help us to reach out to you, Lord, and help us to reach to others that's lost and undone. God, we need you, Lord. And we need a fresh anointing in this church. We, we need an all outpouring, Father, of your Holy Spirit. We need you to move in our behalf so that we can do and be the people that you've called us to be. Lord, we love you. And we need you. And we humbly bow ourselves before thee because, Lord, we know that you're a patient, loving, kind God. And you'll forgive us of our sins and you'll help us, Father, to go forward from this day forward being what we need to be and should be. Lord, thank you for what you're about to do in our, in our midst, in this church, in our communities, in our families. Thank you for what you're about to do. Lord, we'll praise you even now for how that you're going to move in a special way. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pray the Lord blesses each and every one of you. I, I hope and pray that you get this message and that you really implement it in your life. Take it and use it. I, the Lord just gave us a tool. You know, I, I, us men like tools. I mean, I got tools laying back there all over the place because we're working on the bathrooms. But every tool has a use and a purpose, and God just gave us a mighty tool but if I put it in my toolbox and never get it out, it might as well be in the store because I just wasted money. Have you, ever, have you ever bought something and you think, why did I waste my money on this? 
I should have never bought this. I'll never use it, and you have it. Some of you ladies got some dishes. It's in your thing. It's had dust collected all over them. Some, I've got a library full of books, and it's, I've not read half of them. This tool of faith is something we need to make sure that we're using daily that we might be able to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to the whole world, that we might be the warriors of the cross. I hope and pray you do that. Please do not forget the revival. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we've been inviting everybody that we can. I hope you do the same. We've got flyers out in the vestibule. I want you to take those flyers and spread them around, give them to some people, throw it at them. Make airplanes at them and throw it at them if you have to. I'm just kidding. Don't do that unless you have to. But honestly, take, give it to get people at work, people at different places you know, family members that don't come to church, people that do come to church. We want everybody to come. Please make sure you invite folks to come into the revival and be praying that God will really use this revival. And I mean pray, because we need revival in our land. We need revival right here. So I pray the Lord bless you. God bless you. Every heart clear? Anybody got anything you need to say? All right. All I'm saying is what I've said before. I pray for the president of the United States that he will be converted. And I pray sincerely as I know how to pray, that his wife will be converted, that his family will be affected, and that my president will be able to do some miraculous things in the world that we are facing. We've never faced a, a time in America Thank you.